The Vintage Roast with Dana Doot and Jessica Montes. Everyone, welcome to The Vintage Roast. I'm your host, Dana Doot. And I'm Jessica Montes. Boy, do we have a show for you. I'm so excited about this because I've actually never seen this episode, and it's probably the most iconic episode of vintage food TV ever. It is the Grand Dame, Julia Child, making her most famous dish, the dish that put her on the map, the beef bourguignon. Beef bourguignon. Okay. And I, 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 I can't believe I haven't seen this. I'm very excited that we even got this footage, but it's <laughs> get ready for some black and white. Uh, Jessica, any thoughts before we get started? Mm, no. No, Jessica just likes weird shit. Goes <laughs> from dead rats and whatnot. No, this I, is classic, baby. This is a this is an old Porsche 911. Is this like oh, a nice. Gordon Ramsay's uh, that? I just completely blinked on it. You know his his signature dish, the oh, the beef Wellington. Yeah, is it like his beef Wellington? A hundred percent. This that's actually a very good comparison. This is her version of, uh, you know, it's very different actually recipe wise. But yes, this it's like those old SAT things. This Julia Childs is to the beef bourguignon as uh, Gordon Ramsay is to the beef Wellington. Okay. Um, whew, we got through that. So, <laughs> without further ado, here we go. Here we go. The following program is made possible oh. with the assistance of a grant from SMS Yeah, Green baby. Stamps. Put it in my veins with that, <laughs> with that old cartoon Beef Jeff Bourguignon. Hat. French beef stew in red wine. We're going to serve it with braised onions and mushrooms and a wine dark sauce. It's a perfectly... Nothing looks dish. good in black and white old school. I mean... Who was watching this saying, I need to make this? <laughs> the French chef. The best thing about Julia Child wouldn't have been able to have existed nowadays because she's not French. Right. And they call this cultural appropriation, yada, yada. And we would have never heard of beef bourguignon. <laughs> we would never, never heard of Julia Child. This is my argument. This is why I'm pro cultural appropriation. <laughs> Welcome to the French chef and the first show on our series on French cooking. We're going to make beef bourguignon, beef stew, and red wine. Oh, this and is like her first episode show ever. To begin really? our series on because yeah. we showed you so many useful things about French cooking: how to brown meat, how to braise onions, how to sauté mushrooms, how to make a wonderful sauce. And you make a buff bourguignon just the way you make any other kind of a stew, like chicken, coquelin. You can make lamb this way or veal this way. And now here's our beef. And I've made quite a few beef stews lately, getting ready for this program. And I've tried several different cuts, some from the leg called the, the top round and the bottom She's round. very in control and for someone who this is like her I've first made, show I ever. I that I like chuck the best. So these are various pieces of, this is called the chuck tender and it comes from the shoulder blade up here. <laughs> not sure so that knife is in a nice good position. Yeah, get yeah, springy. not good knife. And this uh, is called the undercut oh, of she's the like holding it backwards. The continuation of the ribs along Stabbing -wise. here where it gets up to your neck. And here's another piece of it. This, as I, excuse me, this is uh, literally uh, all those piece. just uh, that sort of look like short wet rags on <laughs> in black and, and white. They just look like the meat into pieces gross. Like that. <laughs> no one knows what you're cutting have, into. It, it, it could be Play Doh. So this looks like Play Doh. Three pounds of meat. I usually count on one pound of boneless meat for two to three people, but if you have a good appetite, you want to have a little more than that. And then as you can make this stew way ahead of time. One pound of boneless meat for two to three people. Three that's that's good. old school 1950s shit. Now it's like three pounds per person. <laughs> until it's brown, and then we're going to put it in this pot into which we're going to cook it in the oven. But before you saute anything, you want to make sure that you have it good and brown, good and dry. So I just take a whole lot of paper towels like that. True. And just the reason you want it good and dry so is because you can't brown it because you can't brown it. <laughs> it's, as, it's as though it were steaming. There's, yes, it would be steaming in the water. The You're right, Julia. And 
I'm it's glad I'm here to check your check your work. <laughs> so you get it good and dry like that. You got to steal her thunder. Yeah. I'm yeah. so <laughs> saute this in oil. I usually use a light olive oil, which I get at my supermarket. And Ooh. we need just enough oil to keep the bottom of the pan. Nice I like that she's using olive oil because it became very out of fashion in the 90s and the early and 2000s to... The oil to use hot, olive oil at high heat because they're like, oh, the scientists say that at high heat, it's not. It's like, fuck you. This is the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to curse less, everybody. <laughs> so, every time I curse, I owe $1 to the Julia Child Foundation. <laughs> or I owe $1 to the fund that's trying to. Uh, to uh, undo the besmirching the of uh, the frugal gourmet's name. That's a good name. <laughs> Start a GoFundMe. Yeah. yeah. I find these wooden spats See, she's moving it way too quickly. It should not be moved. Just leave it for a while, Julia. Let it chill out. All right? If you were really French, you would have known that. Keep moving it around so it won't stick. No, you don't keep moving it so it won't stick. If you leave it, it won't stick, Julia. Man. Oh, no. Maybe we shouldn't be watching this, Jessica. This is going to make me hate my my hero. <laughs> Not hate, but realize that my hero's a fraud, goddammit. Because you just add the oil as you need it. Maybe that pan you do, like, that's a certain pan where you do have to keep. No, Jessica. Jessica, you don't know what you're talking about. All right, don't chime in here on certain pans. It's clearly not a nonstick pan. <laughs> it's definitely not a nonstick pan. But even on a, all the more reason, on a stainless steel, you really need to let it give it a, give it a real crisp. I mean, now we, have, we just have to take her word for it that it's brown. It all looks brown already, Julia. It looked brown when, it was, when you were cutting it. <laughs> It's too hot. I'll turn it down. You just keep turning it around like that. Now, if you're doing chicken, you do it exactly the same way. If you're doing a lamb, a lamb stew is awfully good and it's not expensive. You do it exactly the same way. So while you're watching me do this, remember you can do lamb or veal or chicken. Cotton is just the same as bourguignon. Bourguignon means burgundy. And that's where this dish was invented in burgundy, ah. and they usually use burgundy wine with it. But you can use any kind of nice red wine, as you see. There, that's just about browned enough. Now we'll put this, as it's brown, into the casserole. So do you believe it's brown enough with the time that was given? Um, no, I don't think so. I like to get a real nice crust on it. But, you know, who am I to argue with the Grand Dame? <laughs> I'm also a fan of doing this all in the, that big pot that she's putting it all into. I brown it in that. Then I'll take the meat out and put it in some sort of bowl. And then I'll put in the onions. Like, she's going to do everything in that saute pan and then put it into the stock pot. I think it's more fun to just do it all in the stock pot sort of brown bit here that's left over from the from the browning and this is part of your treasure of cooking it's called a glaze and we're going to deglaze it with our red wine we're going to use about three cups or about two-thirds the bottle and this is called deglazing when you pour the wine in and you're scraping up all this lovely brown coagulated juice which gives yeah so color. if you let that thing brown like crazy you get a lot more of this stuff for the juice now we just pour that in and why doesn't she know that i hate to tell julia that she's a goddamn fraud barely covered it's called this is a vintage roast exclusive we are calling out julia child is this even her dish yeah, who? <laughs> and I'm, you can use a, what's very nice as always is a homemade beef stock. But if you don't have that, you can use a, you can use canned beef bouillon, which is very good too. Don't use canned consomme because that uh, 
tends to be a little bit sweet. I feel like a lot of those shots of like just kind of go out, like out of breath. We're gonna put in a little bit she's of just, paste. Uh, you know, as a, as a woman in the <laughs> 50s, she just had it up to here. I just can't. Like I, I can't take it anymore. See, if she was in the movie, this is when a, when a guy would come up to her and slap her in the face and be like, get a hold of yourself. Half a teaspoonful. <laughs> and a bay leaf. I love those old movies where they would faint just <laughs> at the sight of something. Apropos of nothing, just faint. Get a hold of yourself! You can get them at almost any supermarket. Then... I love it. Like, it's very cool to see, like, things that no one knew about back then, like bay leaves. She's like, bay leaves are this exotic thing that you can get at the supermarket. <laughs> That's off the easy, then you don't get it over your hands. And now, our stew is just coming to the simmer here. We want to give it a little taste to see whether we've, whether we've got enough salt in it. You want to be very careful not to over-salt at this point, because the sauce is going to reduce. Ooh, close-up cam. It tastes good now at all, because the wine is raw. I like it, man. Old school, you can just take it from the spoon and put it right back in with the same spoon. <laughs> this is before bacteria was even discovered. <laughs> People would just, like, die of the Spanish the flu and not know why. Yeah. I love it. Now, this is going to go in a 300 and... 25 oven and it should cook. The kind of stuff just grosses me out. I don't know. I've always been kind of a germ phobe. Oh, so well, like, you were not meant for the 1950s, baby. Checking the oven to make sure that it isn't bubbling and boiling. You don't have to look at it anymore. Beef takes about three to four hours to cook, depending on... The when I was a kid, if somebody took a bite off my fork, I just wouldn't eat the rest of my food. Really? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> look at you now, and now you're, now you're co-hosting a food show. <laughs> Braised onions. Very, very classic. Beef bourguignon side. Accompaniment. If you can get the beef all done ahead of time, and... The onions, and then all you have to do at the end is just the final fixing. Now, these braised onions are something that you can do. They're awfully good served with a stew, or you can... She's out of breath a lot, you're right. A plain vegetable with, She's uh, fucking... Her car this is her cardio for the day. <laughs> this is the 1950s, man. They didn't go to the gym. Any amount of movement was, like, full-on... Like way. level four heart rate. <laughs> I just wanted to show you how you did it. Yeah, it's like she's uh, doing a jazzercise okay, class. This yeah, she was, this, was, this was CrossFit for back then. Put them in the water and wait till the water comes back to the boil again. And then peel them. And when you peel them, we want, we want to cook these holes. So we want to leave just as much of. Uh, these onions, onions are, are um, super begins, annoying to peel. They <laughs> are, what are they called? Fuck. Scallions? No, those are not scallions. Scallions are the ones with the green. These are just like these bulbs. She probably hole. said it and we were making fun of her. <laughs> um, shallots? No, they're not shallots. <laughs> just Google, can you Google uh, uh, beef bourguignon onion type? There are peeled onions, and we're going to cook them in a pan like that. You want to have a pan that will just hold them. You don't want them piled on top of each other. Then we put in a pearl. Pearl onions, that's it, yeah. You want about that, about they're the soup. You can actually buy them that. peeled, like, and almost everywhere salt. now, because they're so goddamn annoying to, uh, to peel. Just they're a wonderful size to eat, but they're really annoying to cook. <laughs> you could also use small shallots. Yeah. On her recipe. Oh, you're looking at her recipe? So she just braised it in water and butter. Interesting. Uh, and for what? I, was, I missed it because I was Googling. But she, she braised the the pearl onions in water and butter. That was it. Oh. This is actually, if anyone's thinking of making this, it's a perfect now, dinner party 
thing to make because you can and julia julia said this i'm just repeating but you can make everything the day before and have it all done in fact stews are better the next day anyway mm -hmm. so you just kind of reheat everything and you can still hang out with everyone in your party but this one and the house will be clean yeah the house will be clean. that one and you can tell because the stem is attached to the cap like that this one is still fresh if it were not fresh at all the cap would have spread way out but it still has that nice curl so you know it is fresh and yeah we can tell what you're talking about with this grainy this black and white footage <laughs> it's like <laughs> talking about the nuances of mushroom freshness and if this cap and stem are de are open this way you always want to take the stem out like that with this one you don't have to why not because it's it's or it's covered water, internally it doesn't have the gills exposed here. exposed gills uh. lift them up with your hand and any sand that's in them will drop down to the very bottom then when they're all washed Ooh, interesting. This is not the current head. orthodoxy on how to clean uh, mushrooms. Um, they say that you shouldn't clean them with water because it just waterlogs them. You should just take a paper towel, get it wet, and just like basically rub everything on the outside. And why? Because when you clean it with water, they just absorb all the water and they just get really bloated. And they're wet, they're not going to brown. And if they're wet, they're not going to brown. That seems like a lot of work like to this. just clean those two now, mushrooms. Them, yeah. We in the we don't want sliced mushrooms. We want quartered mushrooms. If they're sliced, they, they disappear a little bit too much. So to quarter them, you just take the, uh, the cap and do like that. And then we want the stem to look like the cap so that we just cut it on the bias like that. They're all ah. Pro tip, remember. the bias move. I love that little, cute little that. knife she's using. You have a great big mushroom you want. <laughs> That's the type of knife I use to cut yeah. everything. <laughs> You're like butchering chickens with there. it. Now our yes. mushrooms are all ready. And we're going to saute them. I'm going to use... Oh, wait a minute. I'll get rid of this. I'm going to use one of these uh, patent no-stick pans. I like them very much. Because nothing sticks on them, just as they say, and I use it like an ordinary pan. Whoa! Oil in it and Non-stick was a thing. <laughs> These are mushrooms as to what they... they Why didn't she just so use that first time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the main reason is because on a, on a stainless steel, you'll get a lot more of that browning, and the uh, crusty the stuff yeah. will, will stick on it. Uh, so you can use that for the deglazing. Whereas with this, so all that oil, crusty stuff wouldn't have happened. It would have been stuck on the meat, bit, you know? In other words, it I is see. able to heat up a little hotter. Mm, no, the more you stuff. know! It's hot enough, <laughs> and you can always tell how hot it is by looking at the butter foam. So that's a very easy way of telling. And when it's foaming up like this, it means that it isn't hot enough. And as soon as the foam begins to subside, the butter is hot, and you can then saute. So it always takes a little while. You just have to be patient and wait. But you can look at that butter foam now. See, it's still foaming, so you just still have to wait. But if you try to saute in something in butter that isn't hot enough, it just isn't, they aren't, just aren't going to brown. So you have to be a little bit patient if you want success. Mm. Now that butter's hot enough, the foam has gone down. So <laughs> in go the mushrooms. No, almost. No. Well, I'll let them sit for a while over good hot heat. And then what's nice about this pan, you can just shake them like that. And that takes about two or What three is the patch on her shirt? Is that her Julia Child logo for her new show? On her first I don't know. That's a great question. I thought it was like a flower of some sort. Is it a patch? It looks like a patch. But yeah, maybe it is a flower. You know what I'm surprised about with this recipe? I don't see her using any herbs. Like no thyme, no rosemary, no nothing. Just a bay leaf? Just a fucking crusty ass bay leaf she threw in. <laughs> Because if you put more than this in, they'd start steaming, and then the juice would come out. 
But juice. And a properly sold, sauteed mushroom doesn't have any. Juice. I wonder if you can even tell the difference if she put there. the bay leaf in or not. Like, you you can't light, tell girl. the oh you mean taste wise yeah you know so the thing is fresh bay leaves have a ton of flavor so with a fresh bay leaf sure yeah. one dry bay leaf i don't know like See, that's why i think i like five so x the amount of bay leaves when i'm cooking uh unless i had fresh bay leaves which you can find ready. but dry bay leaves are pretty so tasteless like you gotta you gotta pump them up yeah i feel like it would be pointless yeah Ain't no way you're tasting well, one fucking bay leaf in there. <laughs> the oven I have a trick when I make white rice. I put like a little star anise in it. Ooh, it's really good. And, and then you take it out like right after it's done boiling. And once it's, once it's, you know, cooked, just take it out right away. And you still get the flavor. Of that anise. That's very Yan Can cook of you. I bet you Yan does that. I don't think I've ever... This is a, a vintage roast uh, um, uh, confession right now. I don't think I've ever, ever cooked with star anise. Oh, really? Yeah. You got to try the rice trick. Okay, now she's straining the beef into a colander. Then I'll let the sauce drain out. And then we simply put the stew back into the casserole. There. Now we should have about two and a half. Why? She's using so like the cleanup on this thing is going to be insane. She's used <laughs> seventy-five pots and pans so far. <laughs> we also want to take off any fat which has accumulated. If you made this a day or two ahead of time, you could put it all in the ice box, and then the fat would come up. In the ice box. <laughs> In this case, we're just going they didn't to even have freezers back then. Off. The ice box. Unless you're on a, one of those fat-free diets, you want to leave a little bit in because it gives a very good flavor. People were on fat-free diets back then. I guess so. That was I, that that got me too. I didn't know that. I thought it was like no, you ate and drank whatever you wanted and lived until That's thirty. So <laughs> I think it needs a little more salt and it needs some pepper. You don't usually put the pepper into a sauce until just at the end because pepper sometimes can get a little bit bitter so this so this hasn't had any so this is the pepper going in now now i'll just taste it again to be sure always remember to taste things because you can spend here we go taste and put it put the spoon right back in baby right. here we go this is for jessica Ugh, and the rest of the juice on the spoon too she just stuck right back in didn't even drink it all or we could put in a little more tomato paste or a little more. Oh, oh no. In this <laughs> case, we're fortunately find it just right. Now for the thickening of it. Butter. This is a very simple French thickening called a beurre or a butter and flour paste. Like that. And then we work the butter and the flour together. I mean, just fucking add the butter and, and the flour separately into the sauce. It's a very... Quick it's not <laughs> this is an unnecessary oh, step that oh, now we have seven more things to clean oh, in the dishwasher. Just <laughs> like before dishwashers, they have to do this by hand. Oh, yeah. Of the, either the flour paste in and beat it up. These wire whips are awfully useful. <laughs> wire whips. It's like they just came out. They were using like, we they were using like wooden down. twigs before. <laughs> this is newfangled wire. wired whisks. <laughs> It just needs to boil for about a second. And while that's coming to the boil, we put our braised onions in and our sautéed mushrooms. Yeah, it doesn't make sense why she couldn't have just added that to the bowl. That's the thing. It's like everything is being done separately. You could have done everything in the same exact bowl. Like, for example, you could have just braised those onions when you were braising the beef. Like, have the onions in there, too. And then just add the mushrooms in later because they don't need as much cooking time. Like it's a lot now, easier to make this a one-pot meal we'll instead of a twenty-pot meal, which is how <laughs> she did this. Like yes, it'll taste a little different, whatever. But if it were sure, never to cover that nuanced difference, <clears throat> I bet it's I not know. that different. And it turns sour. And it just because you've covered it before it's cold. But we're going to serve this right away. 
So you want to heat it up just a little bit. Because you want the flavor of the onions. She just put the lid on to move it over to a burner? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's going a little too hard, so I'll put it inside. There. In about two or three minutes, and if you'd had it in the ice box, you'd heat it up very slowly and baste the meat with the sauce. She's got like a then, like a modern oven, but she still has an ice box. It. Like when the hell were freezers invented? I don't know. Let me look. Everything was tender and hot through. So we'll pretend we're doing that. You see that the wonderful thing about this? So you say, oh, I can't do anything that takes four hours to cook. It's impossible. 1930s. You've done preliminaries done. You can put it all together, put it away, or you can cook it the next time if, and you can cook it the next day if you want. But it's just a lovely stew, and it's really, it's a peasant dish, and peasants don't <coughs> do simple, hearty... Just clear your throat, that, Julia. Get it, get, just get it out. Ready to serve. <laughs> peasants don't... <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a very nice dinner that we have. We have our boeuf bourguignon, and we have what the French usually always serve with it, which are boiled potatoes with parsley on them, and a very nice green salad of romaine, and as always, the usual French bread. You're going to see French bread on all these meals because the French. I have a feeling she went to France and, and then had this meal, and then asked the chef how they made it, and then claimed it. <laughs> Oh, a hundred percent. Okay. She did this uh, every French dish. <laughs> she like was like an she did like a, a summer internship in Paris. I was like, I'm taking all this shit with me. I'm taking it all back. Because if you had a very old, delicate wine, it would the stew being very robust would kill the wine. And when you're serving mm. wine, you want to think of how it goes with the meal, or how say how the beef and the wine marry. Because if this is robust, the wine must be rather. Well, now next time <clears throat> we're going to do French onion soup gratiné. It's one of the really great French soups, and it's, a, it's fun to make and wonderful to eat. And I hope that you will be with us. And I hope also that you feel that you can make a good stew after having seen this one. As you remember, you can use lamb, <laughs> chicken. Veal as well. Don't you I'm snicker? Gonna... Don't you snicker the <laughs> at at the grand dame of cooking? I was just thinking how many pans it would take to make French onion soup, <laughs> and if I could find that video of her making it. We'll guess. <laughs> I'd say four, three, three or four. Beef when you're sautéing beef, or you won't get it brown. This is Julia Child. Welcome to the French chef, and see you next time. Bon appétit. You know, the thing is, I will say, there's a lot of, let's see, what do we got? We got Julia Child. Julia Child oh. is co-author of the book, Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Hmm. Directed by Russell Morash. Ruth Lockwood, okay. <laughs> These all sound like normal names. <laughs> a fun name. No French names. No French people. Not one. <laughs> <laughs> no French <laughs> people. Kitchen of Lions. Accessories and furniture, courtesy of Design Research. General Electric Co. WGBH <laughs> TV. WGBH videotape production. Videotape production. So, I, I, iconic. That is the first episode of Julia Child ever making beef bourguignon. You can tell she's got a little bit of cobwebs that she's trying to figure out her way around the camera, but she's got a likability about her. I see the magnetism. I see why it's fun to watch her. Also, it's kind of nuts to think that that was her first show. She, there's no cuts. There were no like real big cuts or anything, right? Right. Was there right. a commer there wasn't a commercial break? Was there? No. No, she did it all. It seems. She did it all in one take, like those, like those action directors who do the whole scene in one take. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Um, it's very impressive. She seems very at ease. You know, at the end, she seemed to like not know how to stick the landing and was just kind of <laughs> going a little too long. <laughs> uh, and also, 
Um, <laughs> what do you think of the fork? The kind of fork that you serve the food with and wants to be sharp, but not too sharp. And there's enough to stab the meat, but not enough to break the skin. And, uh, so you, you could <laughs> the director was like, just fucking cut it. Joy, we're done. Get out. <laughs> um, but uh, very fun to watch. Uh, you know, it's very, very fun little window into probably what was the first ever, you know, American food star before the Food Network, before anything. She was number one. Yeah. That's, that's it's pretty cool. cool. Very pretty cool to see. All right. Well, until next time, bon appetit. Also, I don't hire any French people. <laughs> I've killed all the ones whose recipes I've stolen. You can't find them. Thanks for watching the Vintage Roast. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, and tell what your favorite dish was in the comments.